All right, everybody, I invite you to take your seats, or if you're continuing your conversation, please continue it outside, because I'd like to get started with our keynote presentation here at the Planet Microcap Showcase Vegas 2023. Um, I'm really excited about what you're about to see right now. We did a podcast together talking about uh, Acubitas' strategy, Microcap Fund of Funds, so they're here to tell you more all and all about it. So with that, I'd like to introduce Chris Tesson and Doug Porter from Acuitas. Take it away. Great. Thanks a lot. Well, we, uh, we, we titled this Characteristics of Great Microcap Investors, and I want to talk a little bit about sort of how we find uh, investors, what our strategy is, and what context we do it in. Um, just a little bit of background about Acuitas. Um, we're an institutional investment manager. Uh, we're a multi-manager. So our business is really finding and allocating to underlying investment managers or sub-advisors. Um, so the business is really centered around the research, manager research of those investment managers. And our flagship is microcap. That's kind of unique in the industry. Um, one of the largest allocators in the world to microcap managers. Um, we were founded in 2011. We spun out of Russell Investments. So your Russell 2000, et cetera, if you've heard of the indexes. Um, we were there before doing multi-manager investing and manager research. Um, we're eight people based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, a little under a billion dollars in assets and products in small and microcap globally. That's sort of our purview. Um, the only multi-manager in the industry uh, that services the institutional space that focuses down the cap spectrum, and that's kind of unique for us. A um, little bit about our core beliefs, kind of what we look for in, uh, in investment managers. Um, I think primary is our focus on inefficient markets. So looking down the cap spectrum to small and micro cap, especially to micro cap, which I think is obviously relevant to the conference. Um, but for the simple reason is that's where we think the uh, op greatest opportunities for excess returns uh, exist. And multi-manager makes it scalable and accessible for large clients. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how that works in a minute, but um, I'll pass it to Doug to talk about uh, sort of, you know, from an investment perspective, some of the things we also believe. Yeah. And really have two key beliefs, and you can see here on the third and the fourth uh, section there. We want to find early stage products. Those aren't always new products. Uh, in fact, oftentimes, as you know, in this death and rebirth cycle, uh, investment managers, uh, we can find great experience in low asset based strategies that have been around for a long time or a new start for a variety of reasons. So we're trying to find those that other people are overlooked for a number of reasons. Uh, and the other thing related to that, and actually one of the things that we think about at Acute is of trying to focus ourselves in a very specific part of the market, we want to see focus at the asset manager level. So you're not trying to do everything for everyone. As you know, uh, being down in this space in microcap, it's really fun, interesting space. But to do it, it takes a lot of time and attention. So we want to find those that also have a similar focus in terms of building their business in a very uh, interesting part of the market, but one that isn't always going to attract or frankly, from our research, is going to be the best for managing big piles of money. So related to that, kind of this uh, the next, next page in our, our proof statement, and this is uh, really uh, what we've seen across regions, is uh, low asset-based strategies uh, on average typically outperform the larger asset-based strategies. Not to say that you can't be really successful as a big asset manager, but more often than not, uh, the excess return potential is much greater when you're managing a reasonable uh, level of assets. So. Uh, we, we hold to that belief, and uh, that's really been a key to our success. And we, to do that, we need to find people that are um, they're not in people's radar uh, for a variety of reasons. So I mean, that, that, that truly is a, a focus of us, of QTA. That's kind of an important point on the where we fish. And this is low asset based. Not just are they managing assets and small stocks, but are they, you know, are they early in their life cycle? Because life cycle matters. Um, and uh, I think this helps us from a research perspective as well, because we reach out to and get contacts from a lot of investment managers that have a nominal amount of assets. They're early to the space. Uh, in fact, we actually take a lot of pride in having seeded the majority of managers, the products for the majority of managers that we've allocated to. So that means a firm might have a small cap product. They may have 20 years of experience buying small stocks. And we might ask them after looking at the attribution, uh, to just create a concentrated product of microcap stocks. That's all we want. We just sort of want the best stuff. Kind of think about it like the endowments do. You know, they'll look at a hedge fund and say, okay, great, but all I want are your 10 best shorts or something like that. If we see an investment manager, we might run the attribution. And this has actually happened. It's a case uh, where we had a small cap manager 
Um, and the attribution showed that 80% of their alpha had come from stocks below, you know, $700 million in cap, um, which they owned a lot above that. And their small cap product, we didn't want that. We asked them to run a small cap or a micro cap product for us. That particular manager didn't want to do it because they didn't feel like they had the resources for it, which you've got to respect because almost any, you know, people don't often turn down assets or interest in assets. Um, but uh, it's important sort of the, the where we fish as much as our process and how we find managers we think are great. Um, one note about inefficient markets, it's harder down in the inefficient markets uh, in the micro cap space. When you look at large institutional allocators, um, you know, we have one client that's uh, over $200 billion public pension plan. And uh, for them, you know, a quarter of a percent allocation is $500 million, which would swamp most micro cap managers. It's just the asset base is too much. It's hard to manage and cause all sorts of implementation challenges. So finding the managers is a challenge. Um, it's a much more dynamic space than even small cap. You know, the, the database of small cap managers is say uh, 600 managers or so just in the public databases. Um, and, and that's very dynamic. Managers close, you know, it's the one business where sort of the number one ahead of you, if you're number two in the industry, you know, the number one's likely to get out of your way because they're going to close to new assets. Um, but that said, there are so many small investment managers that are climbing their way up. They need to be evaluated for organizational stability, investment acumen, all of those characteristics. Um, one thing we have to evaluate in our, in our process is um, where they are in their life cycles, I said, because taking on too much money is a real risk. Of uh, Managers always sort of state their capacity. And capacity is a hard one because uh, when we were at Russell Investments, for example, small cap managers would sort of ask across the tables, you know, so you think we could manage, you know, and try and get the number uh, as if there was sort of the magic number. And back then, a billion, a billion five, that was the most common answer for a small cap product on what capacity was. Um, but it's pretty hard to turn off the spigot if they're gathering assets, it's coming in. You know, there are small cap products from, uh, from large names in the industry that are 15, 18 billion dollars. Uh, to us, those are absolutely not viable products, nothing we'd ever invest in. Um, so we spend a lot of time setting our own capacity targets, but it's, it's harder down in micro cap. We're interested in the active uh, return. Scrambled eggs. <laughs> um, so I don't know about you guys, but I always thought I was pretty good at making scrambled eggs. And, and uh, But as any good analyst does, I went to the internet and YouTube to find out uh, how I could do it better. Um, and it, it brought me back to the question, uh, and I learned a little something. There's a, a YouTube video out there of uh, Gordon Ramsay. He's got about 50 million hits, which is interesting about him making scrambled eggs. And one of the things um, that he talks about in the video is that he evaluates new chefs by having them make scrambled eggs. I mean, you think he'd have them make, you know, I don't know, God knows what, but, uh, but he starts with the basics, right? Um, and he evaluates their process as much as sort of the outcome. He focuses on process for them on day one. Do you start with the cold eggs? Do you start with a hot pan? How much butter do you add? How much he adds come fresh for the texture. He constantly takes it on and off the stove. So process is important, even for something super basic, like scrambled eggs, who I think everybody knows how to make. And it kind of brings us back to the question of like, why are people, why are humans so bad at evaluating talent? Why do the Tom Brady's, Russell Wilson's, Kurt Warner's of the world all get overlooked, right? It's, it's constant. And there are great investment managers out there. The same deal, putting up uh, fantastic returns and we try to evaluate more process than just returns, but there are some great investment managers out there that just don't get recognized. And the question is why? Sometimes it's because they have not honed the communication of their process. It's how they're communicating as much as who they're communicating to. Yes, you've got to talk to the right people who have interest in the space, but also when you finally get that at bat or you know, chance to throw the football or discussion with a large plan sponsor, you have got to have your process defined and you have to have it to show that it, you have to be able to show that it's, re, it's repeatable. 
Um, because when it comes to us evaluating investment managers, sometimes it comes down to something just as simple as like, how do you make scrambled eggs? Just to um, kind of get, get beyond that point, just related to our, our research and even just to take away from yourselves, um, like Chris said, you know, it's, um, it's, it's more than just being smart and uh, really knowing your stocks well, being able to communicate. So related to our research, we really want to get past, this is where we talk about the big firms and they got the, they got the shine and the sheen. They got the marketing presentation perfect. The pitch deck's great. It looks wonderful. We want to get beyond that because realistically, in our, and I mean, this relates to our process. I mean, the really good managers that are really focused are good at doing this and picking stocks. And they aren't always great at putting together the great pitch deck. And they don't have the perfect marketer. And they don't have the 100 meetings to get into the right uh, conversation to raise the assets. So we want to get to know you where you're at. We want to get to know you when you're sitting there at your desk looking at your ugly spreadsheet uh, and walking us through why that makes sense and how that fits to your process. We want to get to know who's exactly doing the work, not just the person giving the presentation. As we've learned, the person giving the presentation isn't the one who's doing a lot of the work a lot of the times. So we want to get to know who's doing what and really get an understanding. That takes a lot of work. So it takes a lot of, a lot of conversations, on-sites, uh, Zooms, uh, phone calls. Um, just more than anything, we want to get to know you beyond just what you have in your book. Yeah, the numbers tell a story. So one of the bullets in there is, you know, the quantitative analysis is critical input, but we might look at an investment manager and say, you know, they've been exceptional in the sectors that they concentrate in for maybe they're a growthy manager with more in like consumer and tech and healthcare. Um, and so we want to sit down with the analysts uh, on, on those sectors if there are additional people um, and understand why perhaps there's greater acumen there or why there's been success there. It could be luck, it could be skill discerning between the two, you know, uh, takes a lot of asking. Um, but it's common that we'll meet an investment manager where the source of insight can't look you in the eye. You know, they're staring at their shoes the whole meeting and they can't communicate the process. And that's tough. And some of the most successful managers we've seen, which is also not great, frankly, are the managers that, you know, um, it's sometimes it's more, it's almost more caffeine and overconfidence than it is acumen. It's like they tell a great story. There's one manager, for example, that we followed, had a good amount of success with, that was, uh, the individual was a, an accounting PhD, um, ran a large, uh, within a large firm, ran their systematic quantitative products and spun off to create his own firm with just a couple people. And he was an exceptional presenter and they raised a pile of money in all sorts of different asset classes. And he was a unicorn because he was an investment professional. He was a PhD. He was an accounting background. He could tell a great story. He could sell snow to the Eskimos. And he was just, uh, but that's really uncommon. Much more common is the individuals that are stock pickers are spending their time on these securities. And so we want to go in depth about the process. What are the attributes you're looking at? Um, where do you buy them? Where do you sell them? How do you own them? How do you balance the bets? Are your top 10 reflect your, uh, uh, the greatest insight? How do you, you know, how do you trade? Um, all of those sort of at attributes. And then there's also the big picture of kind of the framework that that investment group or individual operates within. Yeah. So, I mean, this is basically just like you look at uh, companies that you're going to invest in. I mean, we, uh, we think about the framework. Are you aligned? Are you invested uh, alongside your clients? Are, is there equity in terms of the people that are doing the work for the client account? Are they, you know, are they incentivized to make sure that the business is in a good place and a healthy place for the clients? Are they focused? I mean, we see these days, are they, are they trying to manage a number of strategies even outside of the business? Do they have a really complex life uh, that kind of takes them in a number of different directions? So we want that simplicity. Because uh, this is, as you know, it's a tough business, and it goes in cycles. And being able to persevere, you need to be you need to be uh, appropriately structured. And then outside of that, too, um, with the expertise and efficiency, not just the investment expertise, but actually an appreciation. In fact, one of the things that we talk about characteristics of great investment managers, oftentimes it's something as simple as partnering with somebody who's really good at non all the non investment aspects of the business. Mm -hmm. So they they really understand how to structure the business so they can allow you to focus on what you're really, really good at. And they can keep you out of, frankly, out of getting in trouble with the SEC of doing something wrong or doing something you didn't think you needed to do, but you you should have been thinking about that. So that aspect, 
um, is something you can't make a mistake on. And then uh, even related to that these days, and I'm happy to uh, talk about this, but just the role of outsourcing. So finding expertise that is affordable, that can help you manage some of the aspects that you're just not good at, you might not know as well, uh, but allow you to kind of uh, ultimately uh, focus most of your time somewhere then also manage a good business. Yeah, we don't do any consulting. Uh, we don't have a consulting business, but we do a lot of consulting because uh, in the investment managers, often there are areas where they need to get up to speed, um, whether it's a sort of compliance or operations or trading or whatever it is. Um, we can hopefully help guide them if there's some part of their uh, organization that needs additional support. If somebody's playing multiple roles and they're not doing it sufficiently, so they're the CCO and the trader and the portfolio manager, and they need some outside help, and there's some things that they should outsource, we're going to tell them about it. Um, we're not going to tell them how to invest uh, ever, but we can help them with those external things. And one of the notes, I just, uh, back on the previous one, yeah, the, um, you know, the Charlie Munger quote of show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome, that really comes into play, especially for large organizations that have, uh, we really like investment boutiques. We like small firms that usually are just either small and micro cap focused and understand it's hard for a firm to just be micro cap or an, even an individual sometimes to just have a micro cap product um, because it doesn't perhaps have the scale unless it's hedge fund and performance fees. So we understand that's a business challenge, but large firms also, they, they often just, our experience is they can't keep their hands out uh, of the cookie jar. They can't keep from meddling with a product. If there's a good product, it's a micro cap product, it's low asset base, it could be the best performing product in the stable, which often it is from an excess return standpoint. And they may close it because you get, you know, a person responsible for product says to the CEO, let's 80, 20, the business. And most of the assets are in our all cap strategy. And the next thing you know, uh, it's ancillary and people are moving on from, for us, from a research perspective, we're going to follow those individuals that we think are great across the industry. Um, but we're more wary when it comes to a, for example, a micro cap product within a large organization, because we just see those organizations eventually get in there and meddle. Um, as far as the, the characteristics, when it comes to sort of finding a great investment manager, I mean, these are just some of the characteristics we evaluate and we actually place a number rank on each of these uh, attributes, but it's still just a part of what we do. It's important. Um, to understand each of these, to have a view on them and to have expectations around them. But it's also important that a manager at time zero is not the same as T plus one. Things change, people evolve, their roles evolve. Um, you need to manage both people and the product. And by the product, I mean, you know, a product at $10 million is not the same as a product at $150 million, right? Implementation matters. And we would rather be the investor when, when that product is a $10 million and give them $100 million over time uh, and be able to, to see if they're meeting our expectations. Um, but we've always said, sort of jokingly say, we look at this in 4D, you know, because you got to take into account time and time meaning assets and personnel growth. I think big point for us too is the takeaway is just make sure that you can clearly articulate your core beliefs, what they are, why. And that you can, as, as Chris is kind of highlighting here, we're trying to break down what you do and how you do it in various sections. You can walk us through all of those things in great detail and defend why you do those. And then also understand areas where you have some weaknesses. So you can give us a good sense for expectations and where you can get it wrong, or where you may have got it wrong in the past and what changes you've made uh, to your approach to improve that. So that uh, communication is key. And all of these things for us, um, I think thousands of manager meetings have, have helped us determine, you know, where we think people have skill and where they don't, but it differs for every investment manager. Your sell discipline for a deep value manager is not the same as for a high turnover, high momentum growth manager. Um, we have different expectations there. And so it really, and I'll make this point again, but later, but it comes down to sort of self-awareness for the manager. You have to understand what kind of a manager you are where you operate and what the style and substyle are, because we're not necessarily trying to put you in a box 
in a style box, but we do want to understand, we do want to have expectations around the performance and around the types of stocks that you buy. And a manager that just says, I just buy great stocks, is it it's sort of, do you lean towards value, growth, wherever I find it? Um, now how do you buy them? How much time do you spend on them? Well, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little. I mean, not great answers, right? Um, there has to be a sort of a definitive process around it. And the better you can articulate that, the better you'll do in raising assets and, and I think uh, performing over time. The other side of it is it's not just investments. There's a business to run, obviously. Um, and all managers want to gather assets. All managers want to sort of grow in their business. Um, there are various parts of it, but the business pressures and strategic direction of the firm can dramatically impact the portfolios. We've seen it over and over again. Um, and when we say we're looking for an investment led manager, we want it to not be an asset gatherer. And usually those are the big firms where it's more of an asset gatherer, but people don't open microcap products just because they're trying to manage piles of assets. Usually it's the great investors that think that they can beat the market, find really good opportunities down the cap spectrum with low levels of analyst coverage, uh, that are going to be discovered and they can generate superior returns. Um, so, but the business side of it is important for us and I think maybe we'll give a, a uh, end it with a case study and take a question at the end if you, if you like. But uh, here's an example of a manager um, that is uh, from the Northwest that we um, find and Doug will walk you through kind of the full disclosure is one that we work with in some client portfolios. But uh, as an example, uh, they were uh, they were at a, another uh, investment boutique that dealt with pension plans. Uh, for a variety of reasons, they decided to close the firm. Uh, the team that was running the small cap assets, there were two of them. Uh, they partnered with an operations professional at the, at the old firm and set up their organization. That was uh, 2016. Uh, they didn't have a microcap strategy, but uh, you could tell just from looking at their history and having conversations with them, they invest in a lot of microcap stocks. So we picked up research in 2016. We spent about a year just spending a lot of time with them in their office, on the phone, Zoom, um, and ultimately just getting comfort with what they did and how they did it. Uh, we took them up to through our ranking process, took them up to a rank that we could then use them in client portfolios. And we seeded the microcap strategy. So they didn't have a microcap record uh, that was carved out, but we had confidence from their work and uh, could understand them well enough to put them in client portfolios. Fast forward to 2022, they're closed to new assets. So they have uh, filled their, their strategies, but they've done the things that we've, we've illuminated here uh, very well. They've kept their business simple. They were able to tell us about how they were gonna add resources. Um, as they grew, uh, and so we had a lot of clarity. Their business was simple, and they closed their product at a very reasonable asset base. Yeah, great performance, explosive growth as a small firm. You know, they manage under a billion dollars total. Um, they've been extremely successful from an investment perspective, and we're proud of the allocation because we found them through a local business network, um, just ear to the ground. It's like as a good small cap manager, they spun out of. These are qualified investment professionals um, and allocated early. So for us, we sort of followed the acutus process. For them, they had a great definable process um, that was repeatable and and, uh, and were able to communicate it effectively. And, yeah, I think, I think one last thing I'd leave everyone with is, um, you know, if you want any more information on acutus, you can find us at acutusinvestments.com. Got a lot of white papers on on microcap, et cetera, or come see Doug or I at, at any point if you want to chat. Um, but microcap, I mean, we're out there doing a lot of the missionary work on the space as, as I think some of you all are probably as well. Um, but I will say over the last 10 years uh, at Acuitas that more of the sort of large pension consultants, almost every one of them has done the internal work on microcap as a viable institutional investment class. Um, and are thinking about it. And it competes sometimes with their private investments, so it's hard for them um, often to get it into the client portfolios, but they've done the work, they're interested in it. Um, and I think that's going to continue, especially with some of the pressures uh, on the private side. So uh, glad to take any last question or, uh, um, or meet any of you afterwards. Yeah. On a return basis? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we have. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we have, I think probably most assets we have with the money managers, a hundred, hundred million dollars, $125 million. Uh, and then the low um, is like half a million dollars, but that's in a uh, LP emerging market strategy, not a, a micro cap strategy. Um, no, 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 no. So uh, we have currently across all our products and just micro cap, 11 managers, um, 11 managers. Yeah. And, and in, um, across all of our products, we have about 23 uh, investment managers. So when we're writing a check, it could be anywhere from an initial allocation of, you know, a few million to a $50 million initial check. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We have, so we generally have our clients, uh, we manage a separate account for our clients. The underlying managers uh, have a separate account at the custodian for, uh, for the end client so that it's, at their custody because it resides at large public pension plan will want they're residing at their custodian. Um, so in microcap, for example, we're not investing in LP structures. Um, we're asking them to manage separate accounts for us. Usually we have enough scale that they'll do that. And, and that's due to our, our clients and their interests. So yeah, that's worth it. Great. Yeah. Last one. Yeah. Um, almost, I'd say over 90% of the allocations we've made, uh, we've been, they've been sort of emerging in that we were, we were the assets, seed assets for the product. Um, as far as them emerging sub kind of $2 billion firms, what do you think, Doug? Probably half. And this is an interesting one too, because it's also uh, emerging manager defined. It's a diversity manager as well. It's woman owned and minority owned. And so um, uh, they had, you know, we sourced them in super early days. Um, and as they started to get assets and performance, et cetera, um, interest around them grew exponentially. But by the time the industry was interested, it was over. They were, they were, they were closed. Yep. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.